Hare Krishna, Raju Hari Prabhu, humble obeisances. Welcome Hare back Krishna. to the Mind Moons podcast. Thank yeah. you for having me. Your many devotees appreciated our last discussion on how to disagree without being disagreeable. In fact, mm-hmm. uh, several devotees wrote to me that it helped them see their conflicts in proper context. Oh, and nice. One devotee even said that he actually tried to phrase things in a PowerPoint. And I thought we could also give them links to your future. If you do the courses like that, he said he will follow you and see if you can learn more. Sure. From uh-huh. Yes, Prabhu. So, Prabhu, today I thought of discussing on the topic of, uh, say, following instructions on one side, which Prabhupada told us to do, and also on being independently thoughtful. Okay. So, these two can seem opposite. And both are instructions given by Prabhupada. So, firstly, we often hear much more the first instruction, follow the instructions. Uh-huh. And become thoughtful is not, become independently thoughtful is relatively less heard. So, firstly, how do you, how can we see these two instructions in a conciliate, in a harmonious way? Any thoughts on that? Well, the harmonious way is simple. Follow the instruction to be independently thoughtful. <laughs> I thought of the same thing. Then it's taken care of. <laughs> but I know you meant something a little slightly different than that. Um, let me start by uh, referencing something from another tradition. So a devotee interviewed a well-known Franciscan monk, uh, quite a a leader in his field and written many books, and also quite a liberal, uh, a broad-minded thinker, and asked this question uh, about when you're training monks, um, how do you, basically the same question you you asked, how do you deal with this, this situation? And then, by the way, remind me, then after that, I'll take something from our, our tradition yeah. and try to combine them. So this person said, assuming that the, in, in, their, in, in the Christian tradition, often in the Catholic tradition, uh, you're a seminary, meaning, you know, like 18 or 19, you go to college, and then you may do another three years. So say you're like, you may decide to be a monk around 23, 24. So he said, up until 30, very, very strict training. They're, you know, just learning the discipline um, and, and, you know, being a, a yes man, so to speak, you know, when uh, the authority says jump, you at, you say, how high, <laughs> you know, that kind of surrender. Hmm. And then he said, uh, after 30, slowly, slowly, gradually giving them more rope, more, more freedom of choice. So uh, that's not very different than if we think about our Gurukul tradition, that the the young boy comes at around five or five years old or so and is kind of a blank slate. And by the time he leaves the ashram, whether, you know, Prabhupada said different things, 16 or 25, whatever year we, we put into that, the, the guru has, um, uh, what's the word? I, tra- I was going to say transform. That's the wrong word. Has placed into the intelligence of the, uh, of the disciple his, his, the guru's ability, uh, discretionary abilities, mm. you know, based on, on guru, sadhu, shastra, etc. And so by the time, uh, so gradually, gradually, uh, the, the student has become independently thoughtful enough so that when he leaves the ashram, let's say, you know, traditionally enters into married life, he has the intelligence of the guru, uh, you know, transferred into his intelligence. And he can you know, live his life in a, in a sattvic way, in a, in a Krishna conscious way. So very similar in these two traditions, you know, this idea of, uh, so yes, like for example, I was 17 or 18 when I moved into the ashram. <laughs> I didn't know anything about the material world and I didn't know anything about the spiritual world. <laughs> you know, so um, having a, a compassionate person, I was very fortunate to have a number of such people and a number of great, really wonderful role models also as brahmacharis in those days. It was, it was a relief to, to, um, uh, to have that, to, to have that, those devotees, you know, telling me what to do. Now, sometimes we've had this problem 
I don't know if, uh, so much if it happens in India, it probably does. But we used to have the problem when a new person joined the ashram, six people were giving him six different instructions sometimes, you know, and yeah. he's like, yes, 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 you know, and not knowing uh, which, which way to go. So there does have to be some, you know, planning or a bhakta program or whatever we call it today or, you know. Um, but I, I like this idea of, uh, as Prabhupada says in the Gita, it's kind of like a military training, right? He uses that word in, in I, I forget which chapter. Um, chapter. And, and I think that that is helpful. Pardon me? I think it's the third chapter, 330, I think. 330. Okay. Yudhyasva okay. Vigata Jvaraha. So fight by giving uh-huh. the lethargy. So there Prabhupada says fighting is like military training. We need for that. That's a good example. Thank you. Thank you for that reference. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's, that, that's, that's healthy. Now, of course, we as authorities, we need to be uh, learned and we need to be practical and we need to be compassionate and we also have to know our limits mm. and be and also be humble enough to say i'm not sure about that i'll get back to you you know we have to, we need to have our qualities but i think there's a good combination in the beginning where the young devotee especially is 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 focusing on surrender and mm. the the older devotee is is meditating how to how to engage this person according to their psychophysical nature how to you know what's the next step not to get them to, you know, jump, but what is the next baby step in their progression in spiritual life and, and really focusing on that person's uh, needs, interests, and concerns to bring them gradually to Krishna's lotus feet. So I think that combination is, mm. can be really wonderful. Um, and, and part of that, even in the initial training, is gradually, slowly, training their intelligence, uh, helping them make good choices mm. so they do become strong and independently fall. We don't want people who have been in the ashram 20 years and at the age of 40, they, you know, they, they can't make any smart decisions in their life and they're still, Prabhu, what should I do? That's not going to make strong people for outreach. It's going to not make strong people for taking care of their health and and, and, you know, and focusing nicely on, it's not what we want. And, and Prabhupada was um, focusing on that in his letter to Karandar Prabhu, which basically what you're quoting when you're saying independently thoughtful. That, that letter was focused on, um, on, manage, on what, how a manager should think, but, um, but it's important. So even in the beginning, as we are giving military training and strict regimented training, we are planning how to help this person gradually um, become strong in their Krishna consciousness and be able to make good Shastric based and also practically based uh, decisions. And I had a professor once who said, uh, it's, it's okay to have your head in the clouds as long as your feet are on the ground. Yeah. So, you know, and, and Prabhupada was like that, right? He, he spoke philosophy 23 hours a day. And he was so practical, you know, we see he was keeping track of, uh, of finances in his, uh, in his diary in 26 Second Avenue and, and trying to, that the devotees don't get cheated when, when they're uh, building the temples in India, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, I think so I, I went to too many places in that answer, but I hope that's uh, helpful. You. Yeah, thank you. Definitely. Let me start with the first point about the phases. So definitely in the initial phase, Obedience is required in any field we go. If anybody wants yes, to get exactly. any, any field for that matter. So that's perfectly fine. And generally, when a devotee has to come to that phase where one is becoming independently thoughtful, so at that stage, we might come because of two, three different reasons. Like you said, somebody is 40 and then they still need someone to give them instructions. So there is a Prabhupada talks in the Isha Upanishad purport that you know, we all have a sense of initiative and we are meant to take initiative for Krishna's, for the Lord's service. So, yeah, so now, so that I would say three different ways, say somebody is very dependent on authority and suddenly they lose that authority, they lose their authority. Maybe they get relocated to some other place or their, their authority departs from the world or more 
traumatically if their authority departs from Krishna consciousness. Then it happened to me twice, uh, two gurus. My God. Yeah, I, you know, I, I know about that theoretically, but you know, that must have been traumatizing, isn't it? Uh, do we want to go there? Uh, yeah, it happened to me and my wife also too. She's also been initiated three times, also me three times. Um, it wasn't, it was somewhat traumatizing, but not too bad. What I did was, especially when uh, my first uh, guru, Jai Tirtha Prabhu, uh, left Krishna consciousness and joined the Gaudiya Math first and then kind of, I don't know what he did after that. Um, I took shelter of traveling Sankirtan. I just got in my van with another devotee and we just left the temple and all the news about what was happening and just went out and distributed Prabhupada's books. And by doing that, it really saved me. It really oh. helped a lot. Just got focused on service. And also, uh, so just, were you I close appreciated... To him? Sorry, were you close um, to him on a one-to-one level? Or? I was one of his first disciples because, you know, I was a bhakta when Prabhupada was uh, living yeah. and, and with, uh, you just barely living, uh, with us. I think you just, barely missed, you just barely missed initiation from Prabhupada. Yeah, I missed it because I missed getting initiated by Prabhupada primarily because of a um, managerial glitch. We had a change of GBCs in uh, 1977 at Mayapur, mm. and the GBC that left didn't, didn't tell the new GBC and the new temple president that, uh, you know, Bhakta Brian. Uh, was uh, ready for initiation. So we didn't have emails in those days. And so it just didn't happen. Um, so, and so after the GBC meeting in uh, early 1978, you know, the 11 gurus started initiating. So in March, I got initiated right after the GBC meeting. So I was like one of Jai Tirtha to Prabhu's first oh, disciples. Yeah. yeah. But I, somehow, I remember one senior devotee came to me and said such a wonderful thing. He said, why don't you just focus on the things, the, uh, on your appreciation for Jai Tirtha and what he did for you. And that really helped because he did, do, he did give me some really nice instructions. And so that's what I did. That was very helpful. And I got initiated by Ramashwar Prabhu. And I, then I kept that, that, that in mind. He, he, he really inspired me uh, in, in Sankirtan. And even in that time, I'd been Brahmacharya life. And I just, when he left, when he yeah, went to do other things, uh, I just kind of focused on what I, what I, how I benefited from him. And that instruction really helped me a lot. Okay. So then also after that, again, you took shelter of some service by which... You were able to, or it was um, after, yeah. Well, actually, after that, I kind of, I continued doing my service. I, I had lost some enthusiasm, and then by Krishna's mercy, I got a flyer in uh, 1987 saying uh, the first Vrindavan Institute for Higher Education. And before that, there had been no. You have to understand, Prabhu. That before that time, there was no such thing as seminars in ISKCON. There was no Braj Mandal Prikama in ISKCON because 87 was the first seminars and the first Braj Mandal Prikama, same year, oh. interestingly enough. Uh, and so, so the idea of studying just didn't exist except brahmacharis getting together in, you know, in local temples. There was no, there was nothing. There was nothing. So what we are doing... And so I got this here? flyer... So what we are doing right now would have Let's, been considered a waste of time, huh? a discussion like this? Well, a waste of time or just unheard of. You know, you would have been a heretic. <laughs> 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 or just, well, why do, what is Chaitanya Charan doing? This is crazy. Uh, so I went to Vrindavan uh, for that. And I got so inspired because I had, uh, I, I, you know, I, I was a student by nature. I loved to study. And mm -hmm. just everything about that month, uh, with really great senior devotees, Tamal Krishna Maharaj, Giri Raj Maharaj, Puri Jampabu, et cetera. Um, and I especially got attracted to, uh, somehow I was doing a little service for Puri Jampabu because he was running the whole thing by himself. Mm -hmm. And then I said, well, could I help? 
you know, it's kind of, you know, I mean, it's not the same thing as in 26-Second Avenue when somebody finally asked Prabhupada, can I help, you know, but, but he was doing everything. And I just said, can I help? And I was the first one to ask him that question. And, and I just developed a uh, relationship with him naturally. You know, it wasn't because, matter of fact, he wasn't a guru. He wasn't on the list or anything. Oh. Uh, so it was much more natural and organic in that sense. And then I uh, did some tricks to be able to go back to uh, uh, a few months later, back to India. Uh, I can tell you that another time, <laughs> about how I convinced the temple president to let me go back. And one thing led to another, another, and uh, I decided to move to Vrindavan and to help serve that. And I became the director of VIHE. And, and uh, the first time, so Burry Jumper was not a, a guru and he was not an issue. I was, you know, so one time he called me into his room and he said, have you ever thought about being re reinitiated? And he, he suggested some names and we were actually sitting in chairs on the balcony outside facing Bhaktivedanta Mark on those balconies in the Gurukul building. And I said, well, I was actually thinking about you. And not figuratively, but literally he fell off his chair. He was so shocked by the idea. He just... <laughs> oh, God. So uh, as I was Jai Tirtha's first disciple, I was his first disciple. Oh, and so that, that was... Um, Govardhan Puja, 1991. So it's been almost 30 years now. You know, in some ways, uh, what you experienced is probably the, the, in one of the most difficult scenarios, because I was taking care of three situations. One is the spiritual authority becomes unavailable for one ever, for the guide becomes unavailable. But uh, the whole, there is, there is a principle of uh, following instructions and quite often in some ways we, we elevate this principle of following instruction even above the limbs of practice, limbs of bhakti. Like in your case, what, what I can say, they say you took shelter of service in the first case, second case you take the shelter of Shastra and in some ways uh, these are the primary ways in which you connect with Krishna. So studying Shastra, worshipping the deities, having our particular services. So sometimes uh, the, um, the instruction to follow the authority is emphasized above the purpose of that instruction to connect with Krishna. And then when we have some kind of connection with Krishna, in a, in a long-term sense, that is what gives us stability and strength in our spiritual life. So it could be through our sadhana, it could be through whatever it is. <coughs> so somehow there is a, at one side the aspect of uh, surrendering, but the other aspect of say taking responsibility for one's own spiritual life and one's own spiritual growth. So how can I how can I steadily connect with Krishna? What is the service that I can sustainably offer? Where does Krishna manifest to me in my life? So this, this aspect of, uh, of you know, finding our connection with Krishna and overall taking responsibility for our spiritual growth, sometimes that becomes downplayed. And I remember the first time, maybe about eight, 10 years ago, Somebody asked a similar class. Somebody asked me in the class. It was that we were discussing the past time of Bali Maharaj and uh, Vaman, Vaman Dev and Shukracharya. So Bali Maharaj uh -huh. refused the instruction of Shukracharya. So I made this point that you know ultimately our spiritual advancement is our responsibility. It is not our spiritual responsibility. Responsibility not our spiritual guide's responsibility. It is not your counselor's responsibility. No, and we have to take a responsibility for our spiritual life. And this is a Brahmachari class. And it is almost like you could hear a pin drop. Everybody was shocked by that point. So <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't think anybody would be shocked now. But I had so, there are several questions that came up afterwards. So then, of course, I give the example how of at the time of death, Prabhupada says that you know, each of us, we have to remember Krishna and we have to 
it's like a fighter we plane. We have to fly yeah. our own uh, plane. Fly our own plane. Yeah. So then I substantiated it, but it was almost as if that that idea itself was unheard of for many devotees. So, mm. so I was saying that this is uh, this uh, in this principle of taking responsibility for one's own spiritual life. So in a sense, you took that and you found out how you could connect with uh, connect with Krishna through shastra or through seva. So this is I, my fear. I have that if we and overemphasize following instruction, then the aspect of taking personal responsibility is downplayed. And then, uh, especially if, like what happened in, in your case and other devotees' case, if the spiritual authority leaves Krishna consciousness, then it is becomes not, it's com- it becomes totally devastating for the person. Mm. Because they just don't know what am I to do. So, any thoughts on this? Oh. So many thoughts are going through my head. <laughs> Do we have five hours? <laughs> um, gosh, so many thoughts. First, let me clarify one thing, uh, especially with the, in, the early, in the first case in 1982, with Jaitir Prabhu leaving. Uh, the, I did follow authority. I, I followed the GBC. I, I, knew, I, I, I knew Prabhupada's will. The, you know, the GBC is the ultimate managing authority of ISKCON. I, and I knew the purports where in, in, in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. I was quite, I, I used to read a lot, but you know, that was, that st- stood out for me that uh, Prabhupada saying how uh, his, the, the Gaudi Math fell apart because of not following his guru's instruction to establish a GBC. So I did uh, take shelter of some spiritual instruction and they, they, they of course said, stay in ISKCON. And so I did that. And then I just went traveling. So I, I so I, I followed that instruction and then decided to uh, go traveling. So that's one, just one point. Um, just a minute. Now you I use, you, it's interesting. You use the word, go ahead. Sorry, when you said this, you followed the instruction. So, you know, there are generic instructions and there are specific instructions. So generic instructions I, is like do your sadhana and like stay in scorn. So sometimes what happens is, we we wait for specific instructions and then we build our life around the specific instructions and if those don't come we feel as if something is missing but in your case you know there are generic instructions which can also be uh, which can also be very important like say uh, study shastra is also instruction yeah. sometimes yes. over emphasis on specific instructions can actually divert us or make us devalue the generic instructions yes yes and, and- and you know, there's, we have to remember the Krishna factor in all of this, that Krishna may give you, look, we have, all, we have a whole bhag- set of Bhagavatams and Chaitanya Charitamrita. There's enough generic instructions in those to last us many lifetimes. And if that's the main instruction that Krishna is giving us, you know, we're getting general instructions from devotees, general instructions from Shiksha and Diksha gurus. And that's, we have enough to fill our time, <laughs> we, more than enough, you know, because all over the Shastra is here, we should hear, we should chant, we should follow the principles, we should uh, share Krishna consciousness with others, there's tons. And if Krishna arranges through his devotees that we get a specific instruction, then, then that's, also, that's also Krishna's arrangement and we can then take that specific instruction to heart. So, you know, and Krishna arranges it in different ways according to, you know, what we need <clears throat> and Lord Chaitanya. So we do have to keep the Krishna factor, or we used to joke the blue boy factor in, blue boy in, factor. in, okay. uh, yeah, in mind all the time. Yeah, okay. That's beautiful. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. You're saying something. No, well, I was going to uh, just, you use this word surrender, and it's a very interesting word. Um, we know, as you know, you know, the word is sharnagati, right? Yeah. Uh, generally, or, well, what is it uh, in the Gita? Ahantva, um, Sarvatharma. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so we, we often take surrender as I say you do, right? Mm. But we also know surrender is anukulyasya uh, sankalpa, pratikulyasya varjanam, etc. To accept. So surrender really means love, means bhakti, means, you know, thinking of Krishna as our maintainer, thinking of Krishna as our protector. Uh, you know, Bhakti Vinod Thakur's uh, 
uh, Sharanagati prayers. It's not just, you know, it's not just the military, you know, it, it's much more, it, or it's doing this with developing our devotion. You know, it's mm -hmm. devotional service. So I, I just wanted to, because we, we, we've kind of used that word, especially in earlier days of ISKCON, and maybe in parts of ISKCON today, as, you know, surrender means I say you do. Yeah. <laughs> but it's much deeper the point of, It's much further. Yeah, if you consider the point of military training, then it becomes like that also. It seems justified also. I, I tell you do. <laughs> mm. Exactly. Exactly. So another point that I thought, I, I thought of, if it's okay, yep. is, you know, I sometimes say this and, I, and it, it shocks devotees, but, but, let, but let me finish before you turn off the internet, uh, that there's certain things that by example, <clears throat> Prabhupada could not teach us. And let me explain what I mean by that. He could not teach us, for example, <clears throat> excuse me, how a guru treats a older devotee, right? Because I think like the oldest, there was like one or two devotees who may have been in their 30s when Prabhupada left this world. Or, you know, maybe some devotees have been in their early 30s, but not most of them, most of us, there was this huge gap between Prabhupada, almost 80, and us in our 20s. So we didn't see how Prabhupada would teach a, treat a disciple when he was 55 or something like that, right? Or in my case, I'm 62 and my guru is 73, I think, right? So we don't, we didn't, we didn't see that example of how uh, a spiritual master would treat a, someone who's hopefully become independently thoughtful, <laughs> right? That, you know, they've been a devotee for, uh, they've, well, been, they've, they've been a part of ISKCON for over 40 years, you know, or something like that, yeah. right? So that's uh, one thing we, we never, we didn't get a chance to see that uh, example. Um, and I think that's somewhat, so, so, so we, our understanding of guru, uh, and we see with Prabhupada when he's, naturally when he's, He's such a wise person uh, in, in, in all aspects, and, and of course, a pure devotee. And then he's wow. dealing with like children. You know, as Ravinder Suprabhu once said, Prabhupada was the only adult in the movement. So, so he, was, he was writing letters about how to take care of our health, right? You know, you should do this and you should do that and take, you know, uh, and, and, and all kinds of things that. Um, because he was dealing with, you know, really young, innocent people. And often, therefore, he was cutting us off and really, you know, giving, you know. And would he do that if he had a disciple who'd been his disciple for 40 years and was in their 60s? And I don't know. I, I'm not going to predicate it, you know, try to predict his mind. But we never, but, but sometimes we, we take that example and we try to apply it, keep applying it as you know, the disciples in their 60s and has been through so many, he was a grandfather or grandmother. And, you know, that's true. so that's another aspect yeah. of our discussion. One, one, just a couple of thoughts about this. One is that, of course, Prabhupada didn't have any disciples among the life members in India. But uh, just now Giriraj Maharaj is completing his book, has completed his book on the Juhu project. It's going to come out soon. So in that he describes his Prabhupada's interactions with many of the life members and it was, he, he was treating them quite deferentially. One reason we could say that they were not so surrendered as his disciples, but another was they were themselves well established in society and they were, they were younger to him, but still they were old. They, they were probably in the 40s, 50s, 60s. Some of them were older also. So that is one example, but not exactly precise. But Prabhupada did was quite deferential in those dealings. Uh, I don't just yes. want to... and there's other examples like that as well. Um, oh, okay. Yes. Near uh, Near Guna Mataji talks about this uh, the very saintly devotee in Vrindavan. She she's uh, she was living in Calcutta, and Prabhupada came to their house and was speaking to her father in a very friendly, uh, almost mind revealing way, rather than you know thou shall. <laughs> Okay. Amazing. Yeah. And uh, another thing was that <clears throat> there is this whole uh, 
point that not only the devotees at that time with all due respect they were young but also it was uh, i read somewhere a quote that if in your youth you are not a liberal something is wrong with you but as you grow older if you don't become a conservative something is wrong with you <laughs> <laughs> so in a sense you know in youth we think there is so much wrong in the world and this should be this should be removed this should be removed this should be removed but as we grow older then we start appreciating what is there yeah we can remove things but we have to preserve things also so i'm talking liberal conservative or different meanings but in that context right. the <clears throat> there the mood in youth is also like you know this is wrong this is wrong this is wrong and then we are going to fix it all so that could also have broadly affected the the way prabhupad gave his instructions the way he conducted himself with his disciples i don't know that is just a thought well i think maybe a uh, a safer way to say that is that he channeled that energy yeah. in 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 pre krishna service and in uh, the sankirtan movement yeah definitely yeah. that's true he, yeah. he channeled that energy cuz yes we i we thought we were going to save the world yeah you know Uh, for the first time i remember first time maybe 1988 or so i just remember this i won't mention who it was but a senior devote just a, so that's 88 that's some you know that's okay iskon's been around uh you no know, 23 years by then and a senior devotee said to me something like you know we could um we could mess things up and and krishna consciousness doesn't have much of an impact on the world and that just you know as we would say in this kind that blew my mind now it's like yeah so what else is new right but that just oh my god i i you know i don't think i could you know eat or sleep for a day or two after that <laughs> like, well you know, we we could mess you know because because we you know we had this idea that we were going to just things are going to just change really rapidly in the world and krishna consciousness is going to just inundate the world with the love of god and very much mindset even though i came a little later i joined in 76 um that was so much our mood this was 88 means 11 years after prabhupada departed and still that that mood was still there huh? at least in me maybe i maybe because i was very innocent or whatever but or or not maybe innocent uh, that's a um idealistic maybe that's a positive way to look at it you know it's a different subject but just going on it's like those who are liberal are often quite illiberal toward those who oppose them like liberals totally. are often quite illiberal toward the tradition and towards so in a sense uh dis- liberals have a dismissive attitude that you know oh this the materialistic people are all foolish science is just uh, ignorance or whatever and in that sense uh the whole mode of thinking is different at that time so uh, i mm. thought of it directly so in that sense the disciples also might not have expected that prabhupad that we can contribute something to prabhupad but prabhupad is going to instruct us in prabhupad will tell us what to do what is right what is wrong giriraj bharat writes in his book that he was there in he was there in uh, juhu and then he saw that Tamal Krishna Maharaj was with Prabhupad and one more senior disciple, and they were practically arguing with Prabhupad. Prabhupad was saying, "We'll do like this," and he said, "No, no, you can't do like this." So he said, "It was a shock for me. How could anybody argue with this spiritual master?" And then he, he yes. then it seems he talked with Prabhupad, and Prabhupad said that you know that so even at that time, some devotees who were senior, Prabhupad did seem to treat them in a way that was almost joltingly yes. different for the other devotees. Yes. Yes, and in 76 in New Zealand he wrote a letter to uh, I can't remember if it was a personal visit or a letter and he said now you are as uh, older devotees I cannot tell you what to do but I can simply request please shave your head every fortnight. Oh god. So he Are you going to Yes. So so there, so my point is there were some hints and how he dealt like with senior devotees like Tamal Krishna Maharaj Giriraj or Kirtan Ananda who was older Rupanuga who was older there were some hints of that gradually changing before uh Prabhupada uh 
left us physically. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. So you're saying uh, this, that was one of the things that Prabhupada couldn't demonstrate to us. And so that's, that also affects the factor that now how, how to be independently thoughtful or how to take responsibility. Was that the point you were making through this? That- yeah, yes, yes. And, and then it becomes a challenge for the guru, let's say the spiritual master, right? Let's say a spiritual master has disciples who have been devotees 40 years and disciples who have been dev- uh, devotees 40 months. Mm. And how to interact with them differently is, uh, and, and if they're in the same room at the same time, how to say things in such a way that's, you know, you know, if you start uh, kind of being a little more casual or, or friendly with your disciple who's in their 60s, the, the young devotee, you know, uh, you know, so it's, 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 it's a little tricky. It's a little tricky. Yeah, definitely. For the spiritual master. So this brings us to one yeah. more question that uh, we talk about following instruction. So from a practical perspective that the a devotee's spiritual advancement, uh, how much does it really depend on the specific connection with one's guru or the specific instructions that the spiritual master gives? Because at least the way we are in our movement, uh, we have sometimes some spiritual masters with thousands of disciples and very few interactions. And in many ways, the devotees may be able to follow the instructions of the local authorities, but it's, it's not realistic to expect them to have the same deference to the local authorities as they would have to their spiritual master. So in one sense, the lived reality is that the devotees who grow are, uh, are often the devotees who take initiative and take responsibility. So in a, in a, as our movement has evolved, has it naturally happened that uh, the, the you could say the overemphasis on following instructions uh, has, has naturally become lesser? I'm not saying that we defy instructions, but it's just that the, the idea that I will be, I will wait till I get some specific instruction, then I will do something. The lived reality doesn't ref, doesn't give much room for living like that, actually. Right. Well, so many things to say about that. First is maybe from a systemic point of view. You know, uh, I, I like to think of systems sometimes. And so your first point about unaccessible, inaccessible uh, authorities or senior devotees. So we need to do more training. So that there's a lot more really independently thoughtful, strong devotees who can give shelter. Mm. We, you know, we need to do that. We need, that should be almost like a, a mindset that, you know, 20 years from now, we'll just have thousands of gurus, whether they're Shiksha or Diksha, you know, or Rampadarsha, you know, but, but, and they're going to be strong in their Krishna consciousness and, you know, exemplary and, and compassionate and loving and all those things to give, you know, because we can't depend on uh, what is it? I think it's like a hundred or so gurus in this con. No, I don't know the exact number, uh, but it's, it's something around that, that that number, which is, you know, we 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 need thousands, <laughs> literally, you know. Uh, so that's that's just a system a systems point that we should be really, you know, when we see a devotee who's been a devotee two years, we should, and they're twenty two years old, we have to remember they're going to be forty five one day. And so what should we do between the 22 years and the 45 years to really make them create spiritual leaders? Mm. I, you know, think about, uh, you know, they, they're green mango now, but they're going to become ripe. Okay. So, so that's, that's just the thing that the Shiksha Gurus should be training young devotees so that they can themselves become Shiksha Gurus that yes. and train them to become independently thoughtful. Yeah, that's true. Yes. Yes, that, 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 so that's, that's really, yes. really important. You know, we can't be depending on these, you know, uh, um, one senior devotee, you know, especially after Bhakti Chumaraj left this world said, unfortunately, this is probably going to be the decade of tears. 
because so many senior devotees are going to be in their 80s and something, and they're going to be leaving this world. And we need, you know, uh, to, we need the next and the next and the next and the next to, to fulfill that. I don't know if this is, I think it may be also true in India, but we have this almost lost generation. Um, I don't know what year it was when, when, especially I guess it started at Chopati, but when, when we really started making lots and lots of good, good devotees, good brahmacharya. I don't know what year that was. I'm, I'm guessing 1990-ish? Yeah, 90 ish roughly. 18, yeah, 90, okay. onward, but 1990 onwards was the really big push. Right. So we had this kind of, uh, and we made a lot of devotees, at least in the West, just around, just after Prabhupada left. A lot of, lot of devotees, a lot of devotees. And then as the guru started falling away, um, I think, I think around the world, we did, there was this gap of, I don't know, I'm just, this is speculative, but around 82 to 92 or something, we have like this lost generation where we don't have that many devotees. And I guess what age, I guess they would be in their early fifties now or something like that. I'm just, and so we, we yeah. do have that, that, that gap, you know, but at least for the other gener, you know, we, we need to start making them, you know, we just really need to start thinking long-term and we, we need really strong people who understand ISKCON, understand the idea of unity and diversity, understand the, you know, Prabhupada's uh, ultimate managing authority on that level, and then who are strong spiritually and are collaborative in nature and, and, and so many things that we need to have a strong unified movement going forward. So, so, in a sense, you are responding to, you are building on the same point that you know, while we have our personal relationship with our spiritual master, it's like we also need to like connect at multiple levels uh, along with the spiritual master. Uncles. Uncles and other yes. devotees. Uncles, aunts, uh, brothers, sisters. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I personally, I never... And I guess it's maybe controversial. I mean, there's two sides to this. I never got so much into when a, a, a devotee said, uh, you know, this is my god brother or this is my god sister because they have the same guru. Because I, I thought, well, in this con, we're, we're kind of like, you know, those who are not disciples of Prabhupada. We're, I always thought that we're all god brothers and god sisters. Now, that could, I can see the downside to that because that kind of D personalizes things and and we all we do need identity groups mm. to some extent so you know even this guru groupism it's a double edged sword because there's there's the identity groups are good you can't you don't just uh, you don't just sort of identify with the world you know you, you do identify with you know a smaller group of people mm. but at the same time I, for me it, it was kind of, i always thought it was kind of weird <laughs> when yeah, someone you know, says, well, I, I'm a disciple, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, you know, I read um, somewhere about with respect to groups. Now I talk about two things like organ organized groups and organic groups. So hmm. organized means there is you're given that you be, in this organization you belong to this group. Whereas organic group is where you naturally group or, or organically group with some people. So yes, yeah, Swajatiya Signasya, right? That idea. Signasya, yeah. So I think we we all will naturally say belong to like a guru's disciple. That's an organized group. But in many ways, we might find some of some of the devotees in that group less like-minded with us than some devotees who are outside that group also. So, mm. yes. so ultimately, I think the organic group is what will nourish us and the organized groups yes, are, like they're, if they are overemphasized then they can they cause conflicts and they can cause sectarianism or even schisms mm. Mm. yes so therefore unity and diversity yeah uh, and we've tried to do that i mean in dc um we came here 10 years ago and there's many po i won't mention the names but there's many this group this group this group they have their own sanghas and their own projects sometimes and we decided that's totally fine 
and then make Radha Madan Mohan, the, the main deity here, the, the focus for all the groups. So that's the unity, the temple, and Radha Madan Mohan. And then, sure, have your diversity and have your different programs. You know, Bhakti Tirtha Maharaj's disciples have their outreach program, and Gopalka Maharaj's disciples have their programs, and Radha Madan, you know, different, different. That's fine. But also come together to the temple, all of us, you know, almost like Sarva Pati Vinyo Muktam, you know, you know, and let's shed um, this disciple that but, and come together as servants of Radha Madan Mohan and Prabhupada. Mm. That's beautiful. Yeah. <clears throat> so so in again going back to that point that in some ways the like you talk about the God God family or God brothers, that also is centered on the point that sometimes the <coughs> connection with the spiritual master and one's 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 identity being defined primarily or even exclusively in terms of one's spiritual master you know that when that ethos is created then again when that sometimes hinders independent thoughtfulness or taking responsibility because then i'm defined in this way then i have to to the extent i'm following this or i'm fo- showing i'm following this so that can become a problem to some it extent. Can. Yeah. Yeah. It can. Yes. Uh, Sorry. Therefore, a few things: the gurus should be training, helping to train their disciples to be independently thoughtful. Yeah. That's one thing, right? You know, gradually. You know, not like I said, the the nineteen year old you train differently than the sixty year old. Right? Yes. Um, <clears throat> And what else was I going to say? Go ahead. You're going to say something. Just one point. Actually, I got that word wrong. It was not organized groups. It was organizational groups. Because every group can be organized. Mm-hmm. There's groups created by the organization and groups that organically evolve. So that's mm-hmm. just a small clarification. So going back to that, this point you mentioned just now that, you know, say a disciple is 40 months old and a disciple is 40 years old. In their in the discipleship, so I observed since I started coming to America uh, that in general the relationships between the devotees are quite horizontal, uh, much more horizontal. In India, the relationships are very vertical. So I remember I had gone to meet one spiritual master. I don't know whether I mentioned this in my last discussion that at one senior Prabhupada disciple who is a spiritual master. And then I was talking something with him and then he said, okay, that is there with his assistant and his assistant was in the next room. So then normally if it's in India, maybe the guru will have a bell or something and the assistant will come running. But then in this case, the, the, the spiritual master went to the room of the assistant and the assistant was actually sitting down comfortably and the spiritual master was standing and talking. So I was psyched out. <laughs> I was, I just put it out. How can you do that? <laughs> but <coughs> of course, now I think about it, even, even the assistant was old, probably around 45, 50 or something like that. And the spiritual, maybe not 40 at least. So, mm. so in general, I have seen, is it just American culture that things are more horizontal? Or is it that because devotees who are in America in general, at least there are many older devotees, and that's why, to some extent, the interactions become more, more horizontal. I think there's a combination. Yeah, uh, it may be that that there may be a bit more of a kind of of that spirit in in America. That kind of uh, you could say casual on one side, or you could say distrustful of authority on the other. <laughs> you know. Um, uh, and yes, and also if you look at the history of ISKCON, I would say that most of the, no, no, I don't know. Yeah, I won't go there. Uh, well, I was gonna say that, that maybe more of the fall downs in the eighties at least came, now this is a long time ago, came from the, the West where you had Jai Pataka Maharaj and uh, Gopal Krishnamaraj, he came a little later. He wasn't one of the original gurus. Um, Bhakti Chumaraj, you know, so they were obviously 
haven't, uh, you know, don't haven't had any fall down. So uh, that that may be it. Uh, but also, you're right. I think that there's, there's older, sometimes older devotees. But I do see younger devotees are very reverential. So it's 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 a it's a mixed okay. it's a mixed bag. Um, but also, yeah, it's a mixed bag. But also, you do things here in 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 the, in, in America. You know, you um, you have to kind of take your car to the shop by yourself. You know, even even well-to-do people, it's it's also just a different culture. You know, I would sometimes when I was studying, I would stay with uh, wealthy people, especially in Delhi, and and you know they don't do anything. They have servants. <laughs> Yeah. you know they're not now i'm not talking about servants as disciples they just have servants right and they you know they have a driver so they don't drive themselves mm -hmm. and they have a cook so they don't cook themselves and they certainly don't do their own laundry and they don't do their own shopping and all those things and you don't have that even many well very i, I live in an area surrounded by wealthy people and you don't have that culture either right people still cook for themselves and certainly they drive themselves. I mean, very rarely does someone have a driver. Matter of fact, they enjoy it, you know? So that, that's also there, uh, that okay. there's, there's more of a do it DIY, do it yourself that's cool. kind of mood. <clears throat> mm. Yes. Cool. So, so we were just seeing about, I thought that, you know, when devotees, become independently thoughtful one factor was where the authority departs for various reasons or one no longer has access to the authority then i would say that is probably the most uh, it can be most jolting or disorienting of course yeah. when somebody goes through experience any situation can feel very disorienting but that's one yeah. another could be say it could be just as problematic that suppose one starts feeling that one's authority now here it need not be the spiritual master because practically speaking the spiritual master may not be there giving practical guidance at a, in today's world but one starts feeling that one's authority is uh, is not guiding one in the right way at one level we shouldn't think like that we should you know but at another level it could be that uh, something they might just the authority might not be practically good in that field or right. it could be that what they are saying is not personally right for me. It could be right for somebody else because I have my nature or it could be God forbid. It could be that something it's just what they're doing is wrong. Maybe it's ethically questionable. They have certain ways of looking at things which may feel is, which may feel is wrong. So at that time, one has to seriously think, what do I do? And uh, so in one sense, this was the kind of situation that Bali Maharaj encountered where the yes. instruction that he was given was, <clears throat> was wrong. So even at that time, one is say forced to become independently thoughtful because I, this doesn't make sense to me. And <clears throat> if one has been taught that to follow instructions unquestioningly, then that situation, one doesn't have the, you could say the intellectual equipment to just deal with that situation at all. So <clears throat> now we hope that devotees never come to that situation, but life is such that we may come to that. Oh, it happens. It happens. It'll yeah. go on for the next 10,000 years. 10,000. <laughs> this should have. I think it's, uh, it's amazing how, I think because you experience so much, so something which is so sobering, you can speak in a way of like uh, nonchalant realism to it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, um, okay, so that devotee has some choices. Uh, he can reveal his, he can, he can, he or she can reveal their minds to a, another devotee, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, or, okay, so in a very man, ISKCON management structure kind of thing, you can go to that person's authority, you mm -hmm. can go to a friend of that authority you know and say listen i have this problem i've seen this and it doesn't seem right or i'm told to do this and it doesn't seem right what you know and, and of course especially to someone that they trust you know all we haven't discussed much about trust but trust is really 
the oil that, that, that has the machine of Krishna consciousness and ISKCON moving in the right direction. You know, uh, trust is, is so important in, in any relationship. If, if someone has a really strong trust with that, with that authority, they may even be able to go to them directly and say, you know, you, you, you're, you're encouraging me to do this. It's, it's, it's so different than my nature. You know, can we discuss this? So you know, hopefully some people have that kind of relationship. Uh, and so there is, a, and there is a chain of command. Now, the other point is that this is one of the reasons why back in 2002, I, you know, and it's only even after 18 years, it's just slowly getting established in ISKCON, is having an ombudsman. As a matter of fact, right now, I'm <coughs> training uh, 43 devotees, I think, are on the Zoom call for, in India to be ombudsman. And the idea of the ombudsman is it's a person who's, who's trained and who has some seniority and is totally confidential. You can tell them anything and they won't tell anyone else, right? And they help you think about your options and how to deal with the, with the situation that you're in. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that can be really helpful. Here's someone I know is gonna be confidential. I could just, I can explore my options or I can just vent and and then and the and and the main principle of an ombudsman is about independent 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 thoughtfulness because an ombudsman is not going to tell you what to do an ombudsman is going to help you think about your options and discuss with you the pros and cons of each of those options and then say so which one do you think uh, you'd like to explore mm -hmm. you know kind of like the what, what verse is that in the Gita? At the end, in the 18th chapter, you know, <laughs> now do as you wish to do. <laughs> yeah, deliberate and do as you desire. Yeah. So, yeah, so that, that's very, and so when you think about it, that's what Krishna did in the Gita. He kind of made him independently thoughtful, didn't he, in one sense. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so, you know, because after <laughs> Sarva Dharma and Manmana Baba Mad Bhakta and all those things, uh, he said, okay, you know, now do as you wish to do. <laughs> yeah. So just going back to this point, like, uh, are we in some ways moving back to the way things were in the tradition? Like when Prabhupada came, at that time, like, all the devotees were young and Prabhupada had very limited time and there was a lot to be done. So in a sense, at that time, the principle of utter obedience to the spiritual master was highly emphasized but if we look back at shastra itself you now it is uh, the pandavas for example when they have to take decisions what to do with ashwatthama krishna doesn't give, hand out an instruction you now arjuna hears yudhishthira arjuna hears draupadi and then he takes a reasoned decision so in scripture itself we don't see many places where decisions are handed down by by the guru to the disciple. In fact, it is more of a general respect for Brahminical culture. Say, Yudhishthira Maharaj is in the forest and he will hear from Narad Muni, from Parvat Muni, from Markande Rishi. And then he takes his decisions. He, he, it's that, so in that sense, uh, if we look at the tradition, it seems rather than rather than submission to one spiritual master with like over dependence on that it's uh, more of submission to the Bra body of brahmanas along with one's own independent decision making or one's own responsible decision making so could we say that well, could we say what could we say that we as a movement you know we are in a sense uh, returning to the way things were in the tradition, where, <coughs> where we had an emergency application where there's a overemphasis on, on just following instructions. But now as devotees are growing, the movement is growing, then uh, there is naturally a need to emphasize the aspect of thoughtful, thoughtfulness also, independent thoughtfulness. Wow. Okay. So, okay. I have a few thoughts on that. First of all, we do, I do feel, and 
and I think Shastra backs this up, that we need to, we should develop more of a culture of uh, respecting Shiksha and Diksha Gurus on the same level, which is right from Krishna Das Kaviraj, right? In the Chaitanya Charitamrita. And that whole idea of uncles and aunts and, and grandfathers and grandmothers, you know, as Jai Dvaitamara said, the problem in early days of ISKCON is there was no grandmothers. You know, the elderly people who could just say, yes, it's okay, this too shall pass. Sit down, you know, ha have a cup of, uh, of uh, uh, caffeine-free tea, you know, whatever it is, you know. Like, so, so that idea of having more, you know, just this, this idea of not just the diksha guru, but not to minimize the diksha guru, but shiksha and diksha. So the next point is we have an organization. So, you know, in our tradition, a lot of spirituality was very personal. It was very, you know, your relationship with Krishna and, and of course, and the Sangha, you know, we, we read in Narottama Das Thakur's life and in Ketri and, you know, just that whole wonderful idea of, of the Sangha of Vaishnavas, etc. cetera. But, but in, in an organization, you, to get things done, you, you generally need a hierarchy. You know, I, I work for one of the mothers of all hierarchies, right? The federal government in America. And, you know, we have a chain of command. And what to speak of in the military, you definitely have a chain of command. And I can't, I have a supervisor. Now I have a really good relationship with my supervisor and it's, it's a little bit on a friendly base. I'm older than him. Uh, but still, you, basically, you lose your job if you don't do what you're told to do, unless it's illegal. Hmm. And even then you might lose your job, if, you know. So, so, you know, we try to, to get things done. You do need, you, you do need, you do need some system and people can argue it should be more egalitarian or whatever, or, you know, some people say, what, what do people say that, uh, um, uh, Br Brahmin life is anarchy, Chatriya life is monarchy, Vaishya life is uh, capitalism and Sudra life is communism. Now, I don't know if there's any truth to that, but... <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, anarchy, my God. Yeah, you do, you do as you wish to do. <laughs> yeah. uh, but so, so, but my point is, we have an organization, and Prabhupada did set up a hierarchy, and 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 that um, is needed to organize the Lord Chaitanya's Sankirtan movement. Mm. Okay, and we have our individual relationship with Krishna and with devotees uh, on that level. Of you know, Guyam Guyam Akati Prichati, and you know the uh, you know. Machita. What's that verse? How's it begin? Machitta Madhata Prana. Bodhe well, that also I was thinking of uh, Isha Panish, uh of nectar of instruction, but yeah. Yeah, the Dadi Pratigranati. The Dadi Pratigrana Guyam Akati. So, so that that is you know so that's there, and. And that's been a challenge because this, we haven't, you know, got the math a little bit, but there hasn't really been in our tradition this, there certainly hasn't been an organization like ISKCON worldwide, right? And so much money and so much manpower and, and, and that, and, and in some places even status. So how to um, combine all of this, because it, it, even uh, I, I can tell you, this is, well, since I won't mention names, it's not so controversial. Um, in, in some places in the West, some gurus thought that the disciple course should be offered after a second initiation. And their reasoning was this, um, because the disciple course talks a lot about ISKCON and, what ha and even has a section there, what happens if your guru falls down and Prabhupada's preeminent situation. But this was their reasoning. Um, it was that people join much more out of individual spirituality than joining an organization. Mm -hmm. And only gradually do they start understanding that their devotion to Prabhupada can be expressed by serving his society. You know, it's a gradual process to get them from, you know, just by individual spirituality and 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 whereas in some other parts of the world, and you can tell me if it's more like this in India, people are much more cognizant. I'm joining this big organization. 
that has so many rules and regulations and things like that. And therefore, you know, so, so I just thought that that was, and of course this is generalizations because it's not that people in India don't join because of individual spirituality. It's not that people in the West don't join because of joining an organization, but you know, maybe some, some tendency is there. So how to have this where, where you, we do have our individual spirituality and our, and our advancement and on one hand, and then the needs of the organization on the other. One way that I, I try to marry these two is that we learn again and again, right, in Shastra, that we make advancement by serving devotees. You know, you can, we can quote five or ten, you know, Mahat Sevam Dwara Mahur Vimukhes, Sadhu Sangha, Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Shastra, right? Uh, so many, and so many places in the Shastra that, you know, uh, love, love me, love my dog, you know, and the whole idea that, yes, yeah, Prasada, Bhagavat, Prasada, right? You know, we, and so if we do that with a heart and with bhakti, so that's the individual part. And if that's serving that devotee, also serving the needs of the institution. And of course, by serving the institution, we're serving the great devotee, Srila Prabhupada. Maybe that's a way to um, combine these two needs. But really, our, we, we make advancement, practically speaking, by serving Krishna's devotees. <laughs> That's the, uh, isn't that, the, what is that verse? That's the mula, that's the root of bhakti uh, in Chaitanya Charitamrita, it's mentioned. Yeah, it's uh, something out of Vaishnava Seva. But, okay, I'll try, I'll try to remember it. Yes, yeah, so, but so, so. So many verses. Yeah, so if I understand what you're saying, right, what you're saying is that uh, that by, broadening our relationships that rather than focusing on guru seva or like the relationship with the guru it's see that there are many manifestations of the guru and focus on the principle of Vaishnava seva at large not minimizing the spiritual master but recognizing yes. that the spiritual, yes. master, the spiritual master himself manifests in many different ways that there are shiksha gurus there are diksha gurus and the guru tattva manifests in different ways so yes yeah Yes, and beyond that, you know, especially if you're, because you keep bringing this up, if, you have, if your spiritual master is not readily accessible, yes. um, having friends or mentors who we feel we can reveal our mind to. This is a huge, you know, we, didn't, we could have a whole hour and a half on this, of course, Prabhu, but yeah. um, this is a huge issue that devotees, so many devotees, and, and, and I, I lived in India for 21 years, it doesn't matter, India, Australia, America, Canada, Mexico, it doesn't matter struggle at some times in their life and even sometimes struggle with the principles and and they just sometimes feel they can't talk to anyone they just fear that if they talk to somebody it might end up on the front on facebook an hour later but they need to sometimes talk to someone and, and reveal their mind and their heart and it, it, it's great if every devotee in iskon has at least at least one and hopefully two or three people in their lives that they feel they could really open up to reveal their mind, say anything to them and, and know that it'll be treated with respect and, 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 and with, with compassion and with care. And, you know, we, we need people that we can reveal our minds to whether we're, you know, spiritual masters need that and, and, and new devotees need that. We all need that. Wow. And if you, and if you can't do that with your diksha guru, you know, for so many different reasons, um, we, hopefully every devotee has someone like that in their life. That's this is so important in the last few years. I have been recognizing this more and more that on one side, we, maybe it's just the way we look at scripture that we sometimes stress, okay, you have to follow the instruction of the spiritual master or, but one instruction is also to have close heart to heart interactions and to do what it takes to develop those kind of interactions. And then, right. then we can also say that then that being independently thoughtful uh, won't become, it won't become whimsical. We're not simply following our mind because we are, we right. can share with someone. And uh, so that is, uh, that is one thing. And you said about 43 ombudsmen in India, that's quite significant. So these are all. No, Eight of them will be like um, the two for each divisional council. Okay. And then the others will be more local. 
their temples. Okay. And this yeah, but that, the, so the, the, the Bureau authorized these eight, but then when uh, Charya Ratnaprabhu arranged the uh, training, he wanted to open it up more that devotees can be trained also locally. Okay. So, yeah. so these, uh, this will be like known online or somewhere if devotees want to know who to Well, I have to work with, uh, you know, I have to work with the Bureau to see how exactly they want to do it. You know, so it's a work in progress okay. that it is something that's um, happening. I, you know, I know our conversation, we, we've been going in a lot of different directions. I hope this has been helpful to you and to the listeners. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. But one thing I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to add, and I don't know where this fits in, and maybe I mentioned it in our last call, I'm not sure. But I was talking um, with younger, younger um, devotees who were born in the movement. Hmm. And they were saying that in their sangha, they're trying to create this trust right, that they can reveal their minds. And, but beyond, remember, this is connected to the point that you were making about how we each um, have to fly our own airplane, right? Yeah. But they were saying that the trust is, they feel is a stepping stone to something a little bit higher. And that is, so you were saying we take responsibility for our own Krishna consciousness, but they were feeling that in a real strong Vaishnava Sangha, I also take responsibility for your Krishna consciousness. And therefore, if you, we, you and I have a real trusting relationship, I can also go up to you and say, hey, you know, Prabhu, you know, you really seem to be chanting inattentive rounds or, you know, this, you're not really, you're not taking care of your health. In other words, I can, because we have a trusting relationship and we've worked on that, I can, they use the word disruptive. We can have also a disruptive relationship where we actually we push each other to be more Krishna conscious. What did you use? Or disrupting? Disrupting, you know, in a positive sense. Okay, yeah. That I can, you know, you know, come up to you and say, this is not good what you're doing. But because we have such a trusting relationship, you, you don't, we take it in the right way. And so they were saying that this is one way that peers can help each other be Krishna consciousness. Yeah. That, that there's enough trust that then you can go up to someone and say um, that I'm really taking responsibility to help you in your Krishna consciousness, like maybe even getting on your case, as we say. And you take it well because you know it's coming from a trusting space rather than from a um, your authority and I'm getting on your case kind of thing. You know? Yeah. It's, I, you know, this, so I, trust is really important. Yeah, that's true. And... Uh, this is, uh, in many ways, much more workable in today's world rather than expecting an authority to know everything about us and then to expect that, okay, you're going wrong and you should do this. So, yeah. yeah. And uh, so we could say that uh, rather than, rather than seeing, say, following instruction of authority, or being independently thoughtful as two polarities, we could say that it's all on one spectrum and it's all about ultimately how we can grow spiritually. So sometimes yes. we, grow, we grow spiritually by following instructions. Sometimes we grow spiritually by being independently thoughtful. Sometimes we grow spiritually by, by having close friends who, who give us space to be thoughtful, but who also give us some guidance. So in yes. a sense, so it's like, if you could say this is, one extreme is being independently thoughtful. One extreme is being, uh, if you have a pendulum, like having authority that you follow. We could say in between could be having friends with whom we discuss and we speak our mind, they speak their minds and then they move forward. This doesn't mean that independently thoughtful is not required or authority is not required, but this could be a much more sustainable way for devotees to move forward. I think all three are parts of the picture. Of course, yeah. You do need you do need authorities. You do need someone who's just going to say, uh, you know, we're going to um, you know make three outfits for Jamasmi instead of two because this is a special year. We're going to do this. We're going you know somebody's got to make some decisions. You know, yeah. <laughs> you need that in any organization. We're not we're never going to get away with that. Uh, and but we also want authorities that are so trained and so Krishna conscious that they also understand the need for independently thoughtful and. They, be, they start empowering the devotees 
and they, you know, uh, and, and they, they learn how to delegate. And now we're talking managerially, but there's an art to delegation. And part of getting things done in an organization is delegating, is delegating. There, there's uh, so much great literature, some good literature on this. Uh, I'll just briefly, I can't remember all the things, but a authority could, let's say a town president could sit down with the department head and they could say some, some decisions, and I hope I get this right, are twig decisions. That means you make a decision, I don't even know about it. <laughs> it's your job, I don't know about it. And then the, the next one I think is a branch. To, what's that? Twig, twig, okay, twig. Twig, yeah. Yeah, yeah I wonder if I can uh, find this really, I don't think I can find it really quickly. Um, but anyway, the idea is that, you know, some are, are root decisions where, okay, so the next one is a branch decision. You make a, a decision and inform me afterwards. Okay, so you, you still make the decision, just let me know after you make it. The next one is you and I talk and then you decide. And the last one is you and I talk and then I, as a temple president, I decide it's too big a, it's, it's big enough decision that I should make it. Mm -hmm. And so if you imagine if a temple president sat down with each of their department heads and talked about these four levels of, of delegation, not everything has to fall on the temple president's desk. And, and of course, the key is to know which ones, which decisions are which, that naturally. Yeah, of course. This is beautiful. And so that's a way to, to combine the two. So it's not, it's not a, uh, it's, 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 it's learning how to, there's something called polarity management. It's learning how to manage that polarity nicely. Yeah. So, you know, it's in a sense, whether it's following instruction or being independently thoughtful, it's ultimately about taking decisions. It's because we have to take decisions. So whether I think the four things which you said is that uh, I do and I inform you or you do and you just inform me, then. No, you do and you don't inform me. It's such a, it's such a, you know, you don't have to tell me who's going to do the four o'clock offering today. That the one that the, the Pujari got sick and you found someone. I don't even, I don't need to know that. Yeah. Right. Uh, you decided to, um, uh, add some, you know, do chop on, uh, I don't know, add some, some special, change the sweets. Hmm. So, okay. So you did that and you, and you told me later, right. But you want to, uh, uh, spend more money on the Pujari maintenance and it'll be a little less money on the outfits. Uh, for Janmasmi, uh, we have to talk about that. Yeah. And, uh, but I'm still going to let you decide. Um, but we're, you know, discussing how to have darshans during the pandemic. Let's discuss that, but that's my decision. Temple President's decision. So just, that's just a quickly off the top of my head decision, you know. Yeah. You know, this becomes a much more, uh, you could say, like, it's, or, it's not even yeah, not even it's not even so about like taking responsibility for our spiritual life. It's more like taking respon or taking decisions responsibly. So taking yes. decisions responsibly could be uh, I defer the decision to someone. It could be that I I discuss and I take the decision. It could be I take as you said take a decision and inform. And sometimes I take a decision. And there's no need to inform also. You know, I if I look back yes. at my if I look back at my spiritual life, I can see you know, at different stages, I've been located in different places and, uh, and been with different authorities di under different devotees. And they all had the different styles. So some devotees, mm -hmm. like when I moved from a devotee who would either tell decisions or like ask me to at least inform, somebody, why are you informing me of this? You know, it was, I was quite surprised initially. Mm -hmm. So I thought that's what is expected. But yeah, this is, this is very helpful in understanding actually uh, how to move forward. So taking this in some ways, which decision will fall in which category that uh, that is, that can be a little tricky to decide. Mm. Yes. And it also will vary on their maturity. A 20 year old and a 60 year old will have uh, the, that will be different. Yeah, that's true. So now, 
just i was talking about the second case where you know where we find that the decisions that were given to us are wrong hmm? for whatever reason practically right. wrong or personally wrong so now here is there also the 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 consideration of uh, jurisdiction or area of special specialization say like for example shila prabhupa that sometime literally arranged the marriages of some of his disciples but then afterward he said this is not the purpose of a sanyasi and then in our movement at some time the devotees leaders were doing that but now it is more like uh, you take blessings but it's your decision so right. so that so the question overall is that uh, the like taking instructions is it primarily for our spiritual life or is it for the all aspects of our life now of course if somebody is living in a temple as a brahmachari then it all aspects of a life relate with the spiritual life and if somebody is yes. living outside and they have their family and job and everything then spiritual life we could say the spiritual mood can permeate the entire life but spiritual life is one right. part of the life then so so do we have i don't think we can i don't think we can uh, categorically say something something is also based on trust hmm. um i had a arranged marriage uh it wasn't by my guru it was by uh, badrinarayan prabhu at that time now swami and but i trusted him he brought me to krishna consciousness he was uh, my wife's temple president um and you know i had um and he didn't say you will marry this person no but he arranged you know arranged it um arranged so tr- tr- sorry pardon me arranged in the sense of recommended or what do you mean by arranged then yeah but a little bit more than that he paid my airfare to fly to okay. san diego and yeah um if if so i don't think we can say across the board but i think your your point is well taken in jayadwait maharaj's uh really wonderful course on straight thinking mm. and strong speaking the straight thinking part he goes over he talks about the uh um logical fallacies and one of them is the fallacious appeal to authority so you know someone is a you know just because someone is a sanyasi and they can give you very good spiritual guidance doesn't mean they they can necessarily give you good plumbing advice when well, maharaj said we should you know we should uh you know we should um hire this plumber well you know <laughs> is he an authority and you know so so that is that is a good point not somebody is not just an authority their authority usually in in certain things now of course prabhupada again cuz he was you know he was who he was and we were who we were you know he like i said he gave medical advice and you know, all kinds of you know practical practical things you know because we were we were just children um practically speaking um and we but it, it you're right it does become uh tricky and especially like you're saying in the congregation right and and i guess in some places they have addressed this by having counselors right the counseling system in certain uh, temples and certain yatras so i i don't think it's one size fits all but i do think as leaders we should be in our training of future leaders we should be cautioning about this mm. and uh you know it's just like if you go to a, you know because the bodies are 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 good are are, are good hearted and even and when we're young we're pretty simple hearted and also we're trying to seek the krishna factor in all this right oh well krishna arranged for me to get this instruction and and that's that, that there's something obviously wonderful about that right but as senior devotees we should be trained to um to be cautious and to uh understand when it's more of a discussion or when we need to get more information right if you if you can imagine going to a doctor and they just start you, they just walk you walk into their office and they just start writing a prescription right away how much faith do you, you know but you no know, the doctor takes some blood tests or or you know what is it called nidhan is that what it's called in uh, ayurveda where you 
uh, the to pulse. take the pulse. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then you have, you know, so, so we, as leaders, I think we talked about this last time, we need to be good listeners. And that was Prabhupada's instruction to Balabanta Prabhu. If you want to attract intelligent people, you need, you, Lord Chaitanya spent seven days without saying a word, listening to the Sarvabhoma. But ultimately he converted him, he, or he helped them become a devotee. And part of it was that, that willingness to do that. Um, so, you know, sometimes our preaching, and I, did I talk about that? Is more like a shotgun where we just kind of close our eyes and we hope we hit something. But when we listen to someone and hear their, their needs, their interests and concerns, it's more like a laser. So we also need to be trained to be better and better at giving good advice yeah. and to be able to, and to be humble enough to say, you know, that's not my field of expertise but here is someone who really is good with mental health issues or marital problems or, or, or health issues. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And uh, this is a very striking point. I had never heard this instruction to Balwan Prabhu that with intelligent people, you need to be good listener. You, you don't know this? No, I, I, it's very striking because quite, I will, uh, I, I can share my screen. Actually, I'll give that access to you. Yeah. So okay. you now why I was why I found it striking is that that in some ways we think of preaching as simply not even talking with people, it is talking to people. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. But, well, and that may work, and that's what we saw when Prabhupada sometimes dealt with 20-year-olds. <laughs> yeah. But if you see, like when he talked to that race car driver, he listened to that race car driver for like 20 minutes about a car racing and then found so with people more established in society, he, he, it seems that he would sometimes deal differently. So let me read. This is, of course, an important letter in my service. Um, now I want that we shall recruit more and more our men amongst the intelligent class of men. They, because they are a little educated, or you can see this? Yeah, yeah I can see this. Yeah. Uh, because they are a little educated or they have some wealth or fame or ability. So they will be sometimes a little puffed up, but that's all right. They deserve it. So he's recognizing if you're going for the intelligent class of men, they are going to you know, be either famous or have some money or, you know, be at IIT or whatever, right? That's all right. They deserve it. It's their karma. Now we shall have to learn the art, how to approach such higher class of men and attract them to apply themselves to this Krishna conscious process of self-realization. That requires much tact. And we shall have to expect to meet all challenges by sharp binds. But if we remain always absorbed in remembering Lord Chaitanya, how he converted so many intelligent men, even sitting for three or whatever, seven uh, days and nights to hear them without speaking uh, anything. And if we remember how Krishna was so patient to explain everything to Arjuna, even Arjuna was speaking like a fool. In this way, remaining always tolerant of others, and I think this is really important, and appreciating their point of view, it will be easy matter for us to convince them to gradually join us. So a college student in America in 1972, their point of view was probably four things, drugs, sex, rock and roll, and Mayavad philosophy. And still Prabhupada said, if, you know, and, and I, I always thought this letter was such a genius because Stephen Covey, 25 years later, comes along and writes, uh, makes millions and millions of dollars. And one of his main principles is seek first to understand, then be understood. And Prabhupada's saying the same thing in 1972. This is amazing. Can you send it to me after our talk, please? This is... Of course. So, the three things struck me in that. First is they deserve it, that they deserve it, you know, they are, they, they are in a political position. So in a sense, respect needs to be given where it is due. If somebody has mm. attained some success in any area of life, we can't, from a transcendental perspective, we might say it is zero, but they are not at the transcendental perspective. So at a material perspective, we can't be dismissive about that. And second is also Prabhupada is right. yeah, the word tact over there. So one is about appreciating mm. their perspective, 
appreciating the point of view, but also tact. Like, like give you an example in a tact in the sense that how with the race car driver, Prabhupada heard and then and tactfully introduced something meaningful. Yeah, this is powerful. Listening is one of the greatest ways to develop relationships. Yeah, and and whether we're preaching to people or we're talking to a peer, a um, one of the greatest services you can do to another devotee is be a good listener. Yes. And, and the other, the, now relating this also to uh, devotees and as an ombudsman for now 18 years, often when I'm listening to a devotee, because that's one of the main things an ombudsman does, uh, and I'm reflecting back some things, it's, it, it, let's say they come to me and they're kind of affected by Rajas and Tamas. And if I'm very sattvic and I'm really listening carefully, and making it clear that I'm listening carefully, you know, sattva sandayate ganam. By that association, they start seeing things more clearly. And lots of times, talking about being independently thoughtful, they come to their own, they just say, oh, Prajvi Haripurbu, thank you so much. I, thank you, 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 you clarified everything. And I didn't do anything, I just listened. But it became much more clear in their mind what they should do and how they should do it. Just by... Uh, just by being suffolk and being a good listener, the modes, the lower modes started going away and they started seeing things more clearly. You know, so I listening had, is powerful on all kinds of levels. That's true. You know, I had a very striking experience exactly this point because earlier I used to have that I'm more of a philosophy teacher. So even when I would travel to some places, I would talk with if you have any philosophical questions. And then after that, just general personal inquiry, general basic inquiry, and then I would do my work. So one devotee had invited, one devotee had arranged me to go to a particular country. And he had said, you know, he has got some corner. So I went there and I came back. And then the, this devotee told me afterwards, you know, they were quite disappointed. They loved your classes, but they said that they didn't get any association apart from that. Mm -hmm. You're busy doing your writing and everything. And then I yeah. said, and they would discuss some things. And they would start talking about their personal lives. Then I would say, you know, I'm not exactly a counselor. So I don't think I can guide with respect to this. So then, mm -hmm. I, so then, then he said, you know what, when people come, it's in a sense, they don't just want to hear classes. They want personal association also. So the next time I went and I, did, I didn't think that I mean, one year I have become specialized enough to give them some guidance, but I just hold them and let them think aloud. So sometimes it, it was, it was such a big, so when I came back, this is, they, they told the same devotee, you know, oh, you know, he gave, we had such wonderful association. So, so it struck me that when people are, are associating with someone, they, they don't just need wisdom. They also need warmth. That if somebody, they, need rasa. they yeah, 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 that means not just, I was not, I really didn't speak much in that association to them about their issues. But just the fact that I heard them out, they felt valued by that. And I just, uh, I tried to be a good listener to whatever extent I can be. So it seems yeah. like giving association is not just like giving classes, giving association could be also giving a ear, giving a attentive ear or a, or a caring heart. That is also a way of giving association. Yes, there's a time for everything. And uh, there is a time for sitting on the Vyasa Sun and and uh, there's a time also, Prabhupada's morning walks, right? His room conversations. So he did that also. And I've seen, I recall one time I was in Kanpur and David Kinanan Prabhu, uh, you know, so he's a, you know, he created that project and he's running it. But sometimes he would just sit down casually with the brahmacharis and they just, you could see they were just so, they loved that. He wasn't, he was just, chit-chatting and I, it just remains in my mind that, that they really appreciate it. So, the, so yes, uh, uh, but listening is very, very powerful. Um, uh, and it's, we go to school, we learn reading, we learn writing. Sometimes in some schools we learn a, a public, it's how to speak, but there's like never a class about listening. And it's one of the most important skills you can have as an adult. Mm, true. And we understand that also, right? right? That uh, listening is such an important part of spiritual hearing. 
you know, and also asking important, good questions. Actually, part of listening is asking powerful questions. And we could, you know, we don't have time now. We could spend an hour on powerful questions. And we also know that from Shastra, right? How many times does, uh, does Sutta Goswami praise Shonaka for the, 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 the question itself? It's so good, yeah. Right, you know, uh, and Priksha, you know. Mm, so true. And you're great at this because, you know, in these conversations, you ask great questions. Thank you. Now I relish the association and I would like to get more and more. Just one last point maybe I'll make before you want to make. So another thing I thought is that through discussion, actually we think also by talking. It is, we just don't think in our head. If you're talking with someone, like you said that you just heard them and then things became clarified for them. So you didn't give any guidance, but things became clearer. So, so you talk something about Sattva Guna. So are you saying that by talking, you come to Sattva Guna or just be? Well, Krishna consciousness is caught as much as it's taught. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And so if the ombudsman or the brahmacharya, the sadhu or whatever, if they're in the mode of goodness and people associate with them, or what speak of Krishna consciousness, then they can, then just by that sangha, they can start uh, rising up at least in the modes of what speak of coming to Krishna consciousness. Oh. And I remember uh, I don't remember the details, but I've heard it once or twice on a lecture by His Holiness Radha Swami how he talked about when he would uh, especially do preaching programs at universities in Ohio, and he would do cooking classes. And he, I think he, I, I remember him saying that he, he didn't do much at all preaching and he made so many devotees just by being with them and showing them how to cook and, and being their friend and answering some questions. Uh, he, and he was like, the le- he was almost like the less I lecture, the more devotees come. <laughs> you know, was, I don't remember the details. It's been a while since I heard that. But you can, maybe you can ask him that sometime. Yes, no. Yeah. So, so just so different people will be attracted in different ways. Hmm. Right. So just this point, I was thinking of it from a different perspective. To like, so what you're saying is, if somebody is hearing from a senior devotee or is speaking to a senior devotee, through that also they are associating with that devotee, and that infuses that raises their consciousness. So I was also thinking. Yes, the, and there. Yeah. So just I was also thinking from the uh, and there are ways to ask questions that get people to be more thoughtful because thoughtfulness is a mode of goodness, right? Okay. Yeah. So what we want to do is uh, what 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 a, what a person in my field does is sometimes is is get people to observe their mind instead of think they are their mind. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, very true. Right. So you can. There's ways of asking questions to say, you know, well, how did you come up with that, that, that feeling or that understanding or that attitude towards that person? Well, where do you think your mind, you know, you, your mind came up with that mood? Yeah. Very and, they, and, and so that's, that's more of a subject thing where you have to be introspective. Yeah, that's true. So one more thing I noticed about this is that when you st- sometimes when the mind speaks nonsense inside, we don't realize that it is nonsense. But when, when we start speaking it to someone, then I might be very angry and I might be on a, uh, on a tirade for some time. But after some time, just because I'm articulating it, I start realizing, hey, this is what I'm speaking is not really sensible. So in a sense, yes, very good. just the act of articulation helps us, uh, helps us start evaluating our thoughts much better yeah. than just thinking inside. So from that way also, we, we rise by articulation to some extent. So Prabhu, I'll... Uh, yes, true. Uh, thank you. So uh, this was... Should I try to summarize? And then if you want to add some few words? Mm, no, summarize. To, yeah, okay. So it's a... I think we discussed broadly on the topic of uh, you know, how to take disp- decisions responsibly using both guidance as well as independence. So it started by talking about the two instructions. One is follow authorities, or follow instructions, and the other is become in, in thoughtful. So one reconciliation is that follow instructions to be independently thoughtful, but 
you talk mm. about uh, Christian uh, monks teacher that for the age of 30 follow instructions and after that you more independence and then you discuss also about how you know, Prabhupada that one level couldn't uh, couldn't give us that example of how he would treat senior devotees we have some glimpses with how we dealt with uh, with life members or with other like parents of devotees or whatever but not much example of that and uh, instructions uh, are important because ultimately if we, we are in a movement and we have to get things done so at some level following instructions is required but at another level it's uh, there are i talked about there are two cases i couldn't get in the third one but when when a devotee be forced to become independently thoughtful is if their authority is no longer available to them or the thought is departed from the world or departed from Krishna consciousness. Then you talk about your experience and then how you took shelter in Shastra and uh, Seva, Sankirtan. So sometimes we overemphasize the specific instruction we might, get, we might get from the spiritual master other than the generic instructions to practice Bhakti and connect with Krishna. So if we focus on that, then we will have the, the spiritual substance. And you talk about surrender also is not just obedience, but surrender is also choosing what is favorable and what is avoiding what is unfavorable. So in a sense, surrender is also taking responsibility for our spiritual growth. And uh, then I went to the second part where if the, if we feel that the what guidance given by the authority is wrong, either practically or personally or even ethically, then what do you do at that time? So you talk about, you know, consult someone else and they're, they're equal or some other dude, they're superior or whatever. And then we talk about the concept of ombudsman as well as the idea that we need many gurus and then many shiksha diksha guru so that the guru is accessible and the devotee is not connected only with one teacher, but a devotee is connected with many and they can get guidance. So that was in a sense, the Brahminical culture in the past. And we are going toward that with having many Shiksha and Diksha Gurus. And then in that connection itself, we also discussed that more important than the principle of following instruction or being independent is actually that we take decisions wisely. And for most often for us, it might be that we need a close friend who can, who can be disruptive for us sometimes if we are going off on a long track. And that requires trust as a very important thing. So trust will help us. They will be able to tell us some things. And then decision making also, we talk about those four things. No, do and don't inform, do and inform, discuss and decide, and discuss and I will decide for you. So I think that is a good categorization. And there was, a, uh, and toward the end, we discussed about how best to, how best we can, that areas of specialization, that they can't have a watertight thing that this is inside the area, this is outside the area. But if something is not mm. the area of specialization, then rather than saying, I won't guide, we can actually just be good listeners. And by asking, uh, asking powerful questions, uh, we can help them arrive at a decision. And in that sense, uh, we can have the devotee community to, as a support for devotees to move onward toward Krishna. So, I'll just add one thing to that, that also if we're going, if we're not, so I'm not saying don't preach and only listen, but when you have listened to a person carefully, you know, you know which part of this huge philosophy to choose to, that will really help that person. Yeah, beautifully put, you know. So, yeah, actually, again, this is, you talk about the Stephen Kavis principle, seek first to understand, then, then be understood. So Prabhupada did that in his letter to Balavan that you know, be tactful, be appreciative of them. So when we hear, then we can like, as you said, we can give the medicine properly. A doctor who hears us, the patient properly, then they can get the, give the medicines. Yes, Prabhu. So thank you very much. Prabhu. This was a very broad ranging discussion. And uh, yeah, we covered lot of, a lot. Yeah. A lot of sobering points, but just, I think overall it was uplifting also that uh, how we as a movement are evolving and moving forward. As they said, the ombudsmen are being created and uh, they're also having this ethos of 
more and more leaders coming up. So thank you very much for your time too. Thank you, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Humble obeisances.